So, going to hear us speak tonight, Mike Grimes, I've got a fine audience here to hear him speak. I've known him for a long time. He was the head librarian and in charge of the archives at the Institution of Civil Engineers. And he was then uh, the director of engineering, <laughs> engineering policy and innovation. I hope I got that right. But then anyway, he was a director at ICE. He, when he was there, he wrote several books and contributed to several international conferences. He has retired now and has continued to do so, including three very fine volumes with Hugh Ferguson, also from ICE. And he's also with me, an editor or secretary of the editor's uh, role in the biographical dictionary of civil engineers. So he's well placed to talk about the building of the canal age. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Peter. Could everyone hear me okay? Is the yeah. mic all right? Okay, thanks. Right, building the canal age. Well, we're talking about tremendous achievements, nearly 5,000 kilometers of canals, 1,000 kilometers of embankments, over 90 reservoirs, 3,000 listed structures, and much of this achievement before 1800 was largely done by small gangs of navvies uh, and often craft-based contractors for locks and bridges or direct labour. But by 1800, the situation was beginning to change with large national contractors capable of building entire canals or whole railways if they were given the opportunity. So I'm going to talk a bit about this process. I'm going to talk about logistics, which you can argue have a discussion about what that means, but uh, mortars and cements, muck shifting, dams and reservoirs, machinery and manpower, earthworks, contractors, if you're lucky, locks, bridges, skew bridges, and some conclusions. So we'll see how we get on with time. It was a period in which a number of technological advances were seen the introduction of the structural use of cast iron, steam power suppl supplementing animal power, not supplanting it, introduction of new cements, materials testing, uh, development of engineering bricks, and uh, Thomas Jackson, Jackson boasts that he was the first contractor to be able to use nice blue engineering bricks on the Tame Valley Canal, and other kinds of developments in construction plants and equipment. And on the slide here, uh, you can see the collapsible uh, centering that was used on the Thames, Med uh, on the Thames Medway Canal which by uh, Daniel Pritchard, the contractor, uh, which was uh, obviously speeded up, capable of speeding up construction of tunnels a great deal. And then there are parallel advances in engineering science taking place. Uh, discussion of retaining wall net pressure theories, arch analysis, design of skew bridges, various hydraulic theories being discussed. Perhaps most impressive really is the way in which flow measurement and rainfall uh, figures were uh, collected so that uh, structures could be designed uh, for the canal safely. And again on uh, the slide here we can see the uh, siting equipment, the surveying instruments developed for uh, tunnel alignment again on the Thames Medway Canal about 1820. These things weren't new, there have been plenty of foreign precedents, Roman aqueducts, uh, the irrigation works and canals in Italy, Flanders, and of course the well known Canal de Medi. Uh, and British engineers could find out about this stuff. Uh, in some cases, foreign engineers like Haken Vermeer. Vermoid in the uh, fifth, uh, 16th and 17th century came over from abroad with the knowledge of these things. Pound locks were available from Tudor times. Bridgewater's agents went to the continent. Engineers like Smeaton went abroad. And of course, you could buy books by this time as well. And in the UK, there were examples that they were applicable in one way or another. Fen drainage schemes, river navigation improvements before the canal age, landscape gardens, bridges, county bridges, toll roads, and warehousing. All of these were of relevance to the canal age. 
And the people responsible, well, these are some of the leading canal navigation engineers. And you can see that before uh, the middle of the 18th century, people involved, people like Thomas Steers, only did a couple of schemes. Uh, and the, the value is relatively modest. You forget about the RPI inflation for the minute. It, you're giving an approximate idea, about £50,000. Then the second half, on the early canal age, people like Brindley, nearly a million pounds of work. Uh, and he and his colleagues, uh, Hugh Henschel and Josiah Close, really dominated this period, both in terms of the scale of the operation and the number of jobs they had. But it all gears up again after uh, 1790, and this period was dominated by people like Jessup, Rennie, uh, and Thomas Telford latterly, where they're doing about responsible for about four, three or four million pounds worth of work. Uh, again, I've not tried to uh, inflate these figures for modern day comparison, but it gives a, an impression of scale. Uh, there are two figures here who are perhaps worth drawing attention to James Barnes oops sorry James Barnes a couple of schemes and William Crosley Jr and both these people were uh, resident engineers in charge of very large jobs uh, and that the, the value of the works they are in charge of really uh, much more than people in, in Brindley's period had been as well. So they're very important figure, figures. Barnes had been a brewer before he became, was put in charge of a canal. Uh, Crossley, it's not quite a clear. His father probably trained him as an engineering surveyor. So what happens? Uh, you set up a committee, you appoint an engineer, you establish a need and secure an act of parliament that enables you to acquire land really. Elect a chair, appoint a treasurer, very important, select an engineer, secure the land and materials, and then you begin to appoint the clerks, present engineers, let contracts. And perhaps not that easy to read here, but this is very early on in the days of the Coventry Canal. They've got people surveying and levelling, sawing the timber, making bricks, cutting the canal, making wheelbarrows and planks, carpentry work, and buying land. So all this is bit happening more or less at the start of the canal. And I'm going to go uh, a bit more into this in a minute. But there's some familiar names here. So Benjamin Wyatt of the Wyatt family of architects and builders. He was a timber merchant supplying uh, timber to the canals in the Midlands. And key figures really were the res resident engineers called the clerks of works. And again, you can see uh, at the beginning of the canal age, paid relatively small amounts, uh, 100, 150 pounds perhaps, depending on the scheme, uh, with the underclerks a bit less and the carpenters 70 pounds and underclerk like green, 50 pound rising to 80 pounds on the Staffs and Worcester Canal. And this pile of stuff you can see in the picture, of the, the papers that Green uh, accumulated for his work on that canal. So you can see there's an enormous amount of thorough documentation of what's going on on these canals. Then later, uh, as with the uh, engineers in charge, if you like, the consulting engineers, the salaries go up, the schemes are bigger, 400, 600 pound bonds on the Grand Junction. Eastern on the Birmingham and Liverpool, 700 pound a year. So the scale of works is getting bigger, but these people are things getting bigger and the responsibility is bigger. Responsibilities reflected in this documentation, really. So I'm going to say a bit about mortars and binders because it sort of gives an in insight into how the engineers operated, really, uh, and how prepared they were. So the use of hydraulic limes. Uh, was well known before the canal age. Uh, Trass and Pozzolano were being imported before 1750 and local lines were known to have hydraulic qu qualities. In other words, they could be used uh, with uh, a good chance of them not being washed away by, when exposed to water uh, before they'd set. But before Smeaton's time, 
So before the 1750s, there seems to have been no systematic te uh, testing, although there have been spectacular uses at Tangier, Breakwater, where effectively concrete chests using porcelanic cement were employed. There was also knowledge coming from the continent through sources like Bellidor, who's accessible to uh, engineers like Smeaton and Telford and Rennie, and he described the use of cement in uh, timber floors of locks and also the placement of concrete at Toulon Harbour. So Smeaton, possibly on the back of this, went over to see what was going on in Flanders uh, in the way of the works Bellidor described. And at the beginning of the Canal Age, in the late 1750s, Brindley was working on the Trenton Mersey Canal and uh, the Bridgewater Canal. And Smeaton was working on Eddiston Lighthouse where he needed a decent hydraulic mortar. He could, had access to Pozzolana in Plymouth, but he wanted a cheaper British additive because uh, it was expensive. And both he and Brindley were aware of local limes. And in, in his book in the 1790s, the Eddiston Lighthouse, Smeaton produces tables. So this is his recipes, really, of various mixes, relative cost, and their relative applicability uh, for various situations. So most of these tests were carried out in the 1750s. And his pupil, William Jessup, would have been aware of them, even if they weren't published. And they reflect the limes that were well known in the 1750s. And when he was appointed to, as an engineer to the Calder navigation, he recognized, as he had at uh, Eddiston, that he needed some decent uh, locally sourced lime that was, would do the job. And he came up with a recipe. This is before work on the canal had begun. So he was trying to source the lime so they didn't start building things that were going to fall down. Uh, four parts lime, two parts minium, which is a sort of waste material from uh, blacksmiths, I suppose. Two parts coarse sand, two parts fine sand, they're using the sand for hardness, and he's using this with pebbles, really, for rubble backing as well. So obviously his assistants, Nichols and Jessup in this case, would have been aware of this work, and he also knew although he hadn't quite worked out its entire significance of the clay content of limestone because there was an impression that the, the whiter the limestone was, that was the better. Uh, but he was able to demonstrate that wasn't the case, really. Well, Brindley, who uh, isn't w widely known for his scientific approach, I suppose, Smeaton is, uh, one can see that he used a variety of limes for his canals. Uh, and on the Coventry Canal, he asked a sample of barrel lime be ordered by way of making experiments in 1769. Oxford Canal pretty much the same time to test griff lime compared to Stratton lime. So he realized the significance of getting decent lime. He wasn't always successful on the Trent Mersey Canal. He used a local lime uh, on the Hare Castle Tunnel. And the, the first tunnel had all kinds of construction related problems. And, was du later duplicated. And one reason was the lime wasn't good. But basically, both these engineers knew of the significance of mortars and to get them in on site as soon as possible so they could be used by the, uh, the masons or whoever. In the 1790s, there was in increasing interest in artificial cements. And the best known is Parker's Roman cement. Uh, and Telford who was by the mid-1790s, was involved in uh, canal construction. Uh, he was also working for the British Fisheries Society, as was John Rennie. And Rennie's works in Southwark was near where Parker had a depot where you could look at his uh, cement. So Telford went along there, and he went there a couple of times and tested the cement and recognised that it did have good... Uh, qualities, rapid set underwater, but it was expensive. He recommended it for its use at Lock Bay for the Fisheries Society. He also used it at Chirk and on Poncasulti. Uh, this is Chirk Tunnel, uh, which is in remarkably good shape today. Uh, he might have used Roman cement, more likely local hydraulic line, but really by 1800, uh, Roman cement uh, was, engineers knew about it. Uh, and although on the Hare Castleton in the mid-1820s, Telford specified uh, 
Barrow line, which proved very durable, Thames Tunnel made uh, extensive use of Roman cement, as did some of the early railway tunnels. So uh, engineers were aware of it, but it was expensive, I suppose. You'd prefer to use a local source. And this is just an illustration of the typical steam-powered uh, mortar mills that were used, Killsby Tunnel, uh, which many developed perhaps 30 years late, earlier. So canal engineers were, had access to this kind of technology. Well, I suppose the main job in the canal really was uh, shifting the muck. And you get a bit of an impression of scale from this uh, view of the Ghent Canal. Lots of people to be bossed around by the man on the horse. Uh, how do you manage all this? Uh, well, indeed. Well, and where did the experience come from? I think this uh, illustration here sort of gives an idea We've got the Bridgewater Canal at Worsley Gardens and uh, the Duke of Bridgewater's estate was landscaped uh, as was much of the English landscape in the 18th century. Uh, and some canal contractors clearly got experience there, perhaps the majority of them. Uh, so the, a few names here, Pinkerton, Dixon, Beswick, uh, Kerr. And this is a picture of Thomas Jackson, the younger who did work on Aston Hall, uh, James Watt Jr.'s place. So obviously that was one source of experience for these muck shifters. Uh, and the dam, the dam story sort of ties in nicely with this, uh, with dams and weirs used in the medieval period and earlier for various purposes to do with agriculture and industry, and water supply. Uh, but increasingly in the early 18th century, ornamental lakes uh, and uh, the introduction of clay cores and then uh, the canal and industrial reservoirs of the late 18th, early 19th century, and the whole technology moving into the water supply uh, sphere, yeah, early 19th century. The great name associated with this really is Capability Brown. He tended to use a clay bank, uh, blanket on the upstream face where it was necessary. But he wasn't the first. James Horne, for example, had used a wall of ram clay at the Serpentine 30 years before canals got going, really. And John Grundy in the 1740s, uh, more or less a contemporary of Smeaton and worked on a number of navigation schemes. He designed a dam for an ornamental lake with a, a core here, uh, and probably the best designed dam of, of that early period. And the British engineers were undoubtedly aware of the uh, Canal de Media and its dams. There's an illustration of the language of that uh, canal dam in Telford's article on the Edinburgh Encyclopedia. But generally, masonry structures were not used. They provide uh, preferred uh, earth embankment dams with a clay core increasingly and the heights route grew quite steadily really from Forth and Clyde Canal about seven, in the 1770s uh, at eight meters. Rotten Park, which you can see here, uh, Telford designed 14 meters high with a central core tapered uh, and with an upstream slope three to one, downstream two to one. And the taper goes from 1.8 meters at the top to 4.6 meters at the base. There's all kinds of ancillary things that are supposed to be allowed drawdown. Uh, and it, the general rule that Telford developed was the thickness should, of the uh, puddle clay core should be a third of the waterhead. So this is good dam design for the time. And slightly earlier, he was involved with the design of a water supply dam, Glencourse Dam, which is uh, higher. And it's the first dam with a cutoff uh, which went through a permeable layer to the rock below. Uh, and this was probably the best example of a, a early water supply and design. Some of these dams failed. There's a classic example uh, on, in the Leicestershire Canal, Blackbrook Reservoir, which failed after about four years. And uh, the reason really was that the uh, Puddle clay core wasn't thick enough, it suffered from hydraulic fracture. Uh, and 
Thomas Hawksley's boss uh, was involved with the design of that dam. So Thomas Hawksley, the great water supply reservoir engineer, was aware of how these things should be uh, built directly from failures in the canal era. So moving a bit more on to the earthworks world, why not use steam? Of course, steam engines were around in the uh, early canal period. Uh, but this is the first practical one. This is really from the 1840s in a UK context. Uh, and these were found to be expensive, only applicable, applicable in certain situations. Uh, so instead, they relied on human power, uh, the navvies, wheelbarrows, and spades to a large extent. But you could get going on with these. Uh, and from, we know quite a lot about the railway rates of progress. Stevenson said a man in a day could shift six and 6.2 cubic yards, and there's also no navvies could fill trucks and wagons, two navvies, about 30 cubic yards of earth a day. So they were big building quite big embankments quite quickly, 200,000 cubic yards on the uh, London Birmingham Rail average, uh, with using Hawthorne run, runs at 400,000 cubic yards excavated, and even more on the London Brighton, probably with the use of locomotives. 650,000 uh, cubic yards in a year. These contracts, the Macintosh one with 525 cubic yards, the uh, Tring one where Townsend was, and the Mark Faviel one, London Brighton. These were all done by people with contract, canal contracting experience. Uh, and the rate of progress is comparable to that observed by the Royal Engineers uh, from digging trenches in the First World War. And the number of people involved, well, relatively few, generally speaking, compared to on the railways, but the Grand Junction Canal in the 1790s, 3,000 people. So that's got a lot of people. And remember, that's J the J uh, James, uh, James Barnes' job, but three or four hundred seemed to be more usual at the time. And what were the... What did the consultant provide? What did Smeaton provide? Well, he provided various profiles uh, for ha as you went along, various sections, and in some cases with a clay blanket, if that was required. So that would have been provided to the resident engineer to supervise the work from. And the same kind of thing on the Caledonian Canal, Jessup, and this is the puddle. Again, so the same thing's available. Uh, and he also told them how to build the wheelbarrow and how to design the tipper wagon. So this is the early 19th century. And the encyclopedia articles of the time, this is from V's encyclopedia, the darker one, uh, and the light one that's over, slightly overexposed. Uh, these explained how he did the calculations for earthwork, various layouts, there's benching in these deeper cuttings, possibly stone, stone work put in, to stop the rock collapsing, various drainage in some cases as well, to take excess water as a threat to the stability. So there was a lot known about this applied to the engineers at the time. And remarkably, the sort of slopes that they were using in different kinds of soil, uh, pretty much carried through into the railway age, uh, as shown in Kemp's engineering handbook at the end of the 19th century. And they were also aware, at least Telford was, that if you had inclined sandstone and marl, it was likely to collapse. Uh, so you had to have a much gentler slope in certain strata. And how much were they paid? Well, there's thousands a yard, Tape me a yard, four tape me a yard, uh, basic rate for excavation. Then the deeper you get a penny, maybe paying a penny more. If it go, you have to call it the greater distance, then you get paid more. And if it's in rock, you get paid more. And Brindley provided some figures for advice on this, uh, on his early canals. Uh, and Those rates were obviously subject to negotiation 
Uh, so you might, the canal company might want to try and save money here. Well, there is some mechanization. It, there might not be steam engines, but there's other applications being uh, introduced here. And this is Brindley's uh, ballast boats, which he apparently use on the Bridgewater Canal. And there's a sort of hopper device between two narrow barges, really. Uh, so you'd move the uh, material along in these, and then you could either shovel it out or dump it out, depending on the situation, build up the embankment that way. I was a bit sceptical about this, really, uh, whether the accuracy of it, but uh, there are a lot of patents to try and improve dredging equipment and uh, excavation equipment, really from the beginning of the 17th century. And uh, this one, uh, the patents is the sort of engraving. And I found uh, basically a treadwheel, human treadwheel powered grabber, uh, which was used on, by the Spanish. And when I say the Spanish, it could have been the Dutch, Dutch Netherlands, I suppose. Uh, in the 16th century, there's a model of that in Philip II's collection. Uh, in Madrid, uh, and this patent in the 1750s has got a hopper device. So Brindley's probably state of the art at the time. This is one device that was used on the Hereford and Gloucester, and also briefly on the Gloucester Sharp Nest Canal, which is Kahn's machine, which uses various wheels to move uh, material up and down, and it was supposed to do it more cheaply, fourpence compared to sixpence at cubic yard excavation. Uh, the canal company paid £630 for it, and then they discovered that the people couldn't work it. It was designed by uh, a miner in Cornwall. Uh, so it proved too expensive, too clumsy to use, and it was abandoned. Uh, so that was an early trial in the, around 1790. But one area where there was a lot of progress with, was with steam dredges and their introduction. So a, 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 a muck shifting contractor, William Buff, uh, in partnership with John Hughes, who was doing work in London docks, and the Thames Lightham and John Mills, they kitted out a barge uh, as a bucket dredger uh, in the 1806, and then they increased the power and built more and more sophisticated ones. You can see here with a Trevivik style high pressure engine. One of these was used uh, by Hughes on the uh, Caledonian Canal subsequently. So these were being used on canal construction and obviously on river navigation works as well. And what did the engineers get up to on looking at these uh, works? Well, Brindley in 1769, he comes along on site to do his inspection. Uh, and says the soil dug out of the canal should be laid full three yards from the edge to the towing path side and two to three feet on the other side according to the soil that the clerks be absolutely required to lay bare no more surface than is necessary and I think both of these uh, statements indicate that site control wasn't what it might have been uh, the navvies were just throwing it out of the excavation on the side so it could fall back in again uh, and of course, it was in the navvy's interest to dig out as much as possible because they were getting paid, generally speaking, by the amount of muck they shifted rather than getting the job done. Uh, and then uh, he also said the basin at Bishopgate uh, be puddled with a loaded broad wheel cart drawn by horses abreast. So the no notion of it being done by men uh, puddling uh, is obviously they tried to speed things up and do it more quickly. And um, on the Slacks Valley embankment on the Rochdale Canal, Jessup had this to say about how to build an embankment. The most proper way is to form the external slopes first, fill up the middle afterwards in order that its settlement may form itself into a concave lamini instead of convex. The men be immediately employed in taking the earth from under the stage. As it falls from the wagons and therewith forming the external slopes so as to at least to carry the whole together on a uniform level. If you did it the other way, basically you'd cause landslips. Instead of using water to puddle the bottom, it, i.e. the clay lump, should be trampled layer after layer by heavy horses. So he was an advocate of a similar system to Brindley. 
When the bottom's thus secured so as to prevent water getting into the body of the embankment, the side banks may be formed without hazard. So water was a great enemy uh, to these embankments as well. And Robert Whitworth on a little bit later on the Burnley Embankment, the Leeds and Liverpool Canal. The valley's 12 and 15 yards long, from level to level, the greatest depth is 52 feet. To bank up this valley will require about 545,000 cubic yards of earth, some part of which must be brought by long wheelings from each end and in hand carts or otherwise, some by boats. The greatest part must be obtained by back cutting where a great number of men may be employed. I think the most proper method of procedure will be to complete the bank, form the canal at each end of the valley to about 12 feet high. Indeed, at the south end, it may go to 14 or 15 foot high, as there's such plenty of water near. Here will be necessary to make a perpendicular puddle on the side with a cross puddle at the ends and a firm down across with planks. While this is doing, I begin to form the base of the bank by back cutting almost from one end to the other, on both sides in different lots which may all be measured with accuracy. At the same time, the level part of the canal may be forming from the south end to the bank to the end of the deep cutting to make ready for boats to carry the surplus earth away in which there'll be about 50, 58,000 cubic yards. So basically he's bringing the embankment in from the north and south uh, at, a, at the height, using boats to move material from the end. And he's... To do it with expedition, it'll be necessary to make and enclose a basin at the south end with planks, so large as to have a short boat, supposing 40 foot long, to be across at the head, full-size boat about 60 foot long on each side. Thus, three boats may be always unloading at a time. At the same time may be loading. The best way to convey the earth from the boats will be in hand carts, carrying about 12 or 1500 weight. At the head and two sides of the basin, it'll be necessary to make platforms of planks, 10 foot wide, such height that the handcarts may be leveled with the planking that surrounds the basin, where a number of handcarts may be filling out of the boats at the same time. There's six or eight on each side, five or six at the head. A man will easily drive 12 or 1400 weight before him if there's a uh, runs be laid with a proper descent. He may discharge in a moment when he gets to the place of discharging. Narrow boats, not more than seven or foot, eight foot wide, will be best for this business as there would be much easier filled to fill in cut into carts. So really then using boats to get the stuff to the head of the uh, embankment and then using carts and then tipping it over, building it up. On the Birmingham Canal, which was largely completed in 1771, they lowered the summit at Smethwick in the late 1780s, 286,000 cubic meters of excavation. They had two portable steam engines at work there for hauling uh, wagons, boats, and using horse gins as well. So it's a couple of years. It's very comparable to the rates of progress on the London Birmingham Railway. That, and the scan at Smethwick Cutting, which was done by Telford as engineer, Mackenzie, the royal, uh, the uh, resident engineer, Townsend. The contractor who was contracted again on the London Birmingham, 70 foot deep, 1.38 million cubic meters of earth are moved using 300 workers. So a tremendous rate of progress there and more or less contemporary with the Macclesfield Canal, Bollington embankments, again Telford, Crosley the resident engineer, Sewell's the contractor, one to one slope using local stone between 100 and 150,000 cubic meters of rock fill. And Soares went on to be a contractor at Wolverton Railway Embankment on the London Birmingham Railway. I found this uh, picture in Kemp recently. And down at the bottom here, so that up here you see how they successively excavate, typically a, a cutting. Uh, but down at the bottom, this curious thing. So we've got a, basically an adit. Uh, being driven there, then from above, you sink shafts and you start tipping the earth into wagons running along. So this is the 1890s, which uh, Kemp says is the best way of doing it at that time. But Thomas Jackson, the contractor, said on the Birmingham and Liverpool Junction Canal in 1826, he described going and cut it, doing a cutting, 
removed by tram wagons. Before any wagons can be filled, an entrance has to be made into the hill by what's called a barrow road, quantity of earth being excavated, filled into barrows, wheeled away to form the embankment. So he did this. So it seems as that method of construction was anticipated in the eight, certainly by the 1820s. Uh, how dangerous it was, one can only speculate. A little bit about locks, not much, uh, not much time really. Uh, in the Middle Ages, flash locks were generally used, so they would, had paddles and weirs to divert the uh, flow of the river uh, into the navigable channel. But in the Tudor period, the Exeter Canal, there were turf locks uh, installed with mitre gates, then one up near Waltham Abbey, uh, and through the 17th century more. So by 1700, there's about 40 pound locks in use, uh, mostly turf sided and timber frame, but some masonry. And then as the 18th century progresses, uh, there's more with masonry walls and timber floors. No standardization of size, really, uh, just what the boats of the navigation will seem to require. Uh, but by the middle of the 18th century, I think there were people on some of the river navigations in the north of England in particular who were used to building dams with masonry walls, counterforts and timber beams. You've got uh, a bit of a variety here. Now, Telford pointed out uh, that these sort of very attractive in plan and indeed to see on the uh, Canal de Midi with the curvature, presumably to resist uh, earth pressure. Uh, but very wasteful of water. You were much better off with straight walls, uh, with some kind of revetments and counterforts. The earlier ones generally had a timber floor, but pretty early on, that it, particularly where ground, the ground was bad. They were using inverted arches as well for these structures. Uh, so I, I think that, this, that these were fairly standard by the uh, end of the Brindley period, really. And the, the classic example, really, of lock construction in some ways is the Clacknahari Sea Lock, uh, which is very interesting in terms of its geotechnical design and geotechnical uh, case study. So it was designed by Telford and Jasper. Uh, it's a large sea lock and there's underlying it as a soft seal, it's a clay layer, 55 foot deep. And basically they recognized this as being a problem and decided to pile up uh, basically quarry waste and other material and initially for six months and it's still subsiding. So they piled more on. So after about 18 months, two years of squeezing out mud and water, it seemed to stabilize. Uh, and then they excavated over a, a following year and then built the lockup over the year after that. And it's uh, basically settlement ceased. It's uh, proved that the pre-consolidation worked there. What more, a bit more about the contractors, Edward Banks there and uh, the, the dock pictures here deliberately the early people, well, before the canal age, there were some people t tending for quite big, for the time, jobs, even True did the whole of the Exeter Canal. Uh, but when Brindley got going, they sent these people tend to be paid daily. And it's not really, for example, as one can see here in this picture, that uh, Thomas Sheesby on the second phase of the Coventry Canal is doing a relatively big contract of about 8,000. Uh, around the same time, Pinkerton's tendering for the Basingstoke Canal. And generally, they would then employ teams of gangs, subcontractors. Uh, Alexander Stevens on the Loon Aqueduct, that's a jo big job, 48,000. But just before 1820, Hugh McIntosh is offering to build the whole of the Union Canal. He wasn't allowed to, but he was tendering for it. So the contract sizes basically by the 1820s are similar uh, really to what would be found on the early railways, or indeed bigger. And what one also sees is that 
although people like Beswick and Houghton and Ford did quite a few canals, Pinkerton a lot, the, the capital value of these works compared to what's going on uh, really with the Macintosh and Banks uh, from 1790 onwards is much, much smaller. And a lot of these early canal people like the Knowles and Treadwells who started on a small scale uh, made the transition successfully into the railway age and became very successful railway contractors. So there was a transition there. But pretty typical is the Boff family uh, who worked through the uh, Canal Age, typical of really careers for civil engineer contractors of the time, small contracts with various partners and the contracting and supervision. Possibly there's a family, family connection between them. So Buff's basically, uh, James Buff's basically in the West Midlands. He worked as a bricklayer and mason and ended up as a salaried employer of the Birmingham Canal, possibly because it was a more reliable source of income. And he tended for a bridge we can see here on uh, the Stroudwater Canal. He was for 24, nearly 25 pounds. He was obviously shown a drawing or model uh, but the company supplied, this is 1776, the company supplied all the materials for him. And William Buff starts his career as a muck shifter, supervising people uh, on canals around Somerset. He's an agent for John Holmes uh, under John Rennie. Uh, seems to have got a bit of capital and start tendering independently, but quite small scale things. But then the pair of them, that's Holmes and Buff, taken on by Jessup and Rennie for the import dock excavation at London Docks, uh, where they're using steam engines to pump it out, uh, six horsepower engines to haul the muck, and they shifted uh, over a million cubic metres of earth uh, at a rate of six, over 6,000 cubic metres a week using that steam engine, and uh, similar rates of progress on London Docks just a little bit later. Uh, they got Lots of men, lots of horses, uh, but Hugh McIntosh is working pretty much alongside them, is doing it at a similar sort of rate. So they're using rails, wagons, horses, all kinds of ropes, uh, and getting up to the sort of speed, if not exceeding the speed that was seen on the early railways. This was being done by people, experienced canal contractors. I'm just going back to the railways, Thomas Townsend contractor on the uh, London Birmingham. So a similar amount of excavation is on the Birmingham Canal. He had 60 barrow runs, we can see here, in half a mile, up to two and a half thousand men at work, which is a lot more than we're at work on the canals, generally speaking. And about a third of the contractors on the London Birmingham Railway had experience of, uh, can of canals. Uh, so it's a high proportion of transition, really. A little bit about uh, bridges, not going to say very much. Uh, these affairs were quite modest, most of them, uh, as you can see here. The Barton Aqueduct, quite small spans, three arches, one by 63 foot, two by 24 foot, low rise segmental arches. Stretford Aqueduct, a bit slightly bigger span on the same canal. Uh, and they used puddle to keep the, uh, these aqueducts uh, waterproof to an extent. They used piles and inverted arches where necessary. Whitworth's Kelvin Canal, uh, looks slightly longer, wide, uh, with walls, arches curved in plan, which you can see here. So resist the water in some way. Uh, and the drawings from one of Rennie's uh, for the Lancaster Canal. Uh, so quite fine drawings being produced by the 1790s for the contractors. And probably the finest example of the uh, canal era is Loon Aqueduct of Rennie uh, design. And this is a bit bigger, five 70 foot arches. The spandles have three longitudinal voids behind them with pointed arches uh, to support the, uh, su the structure above. And th they had a, he had a three foot bed of puddle in this and a concave stone canal base. And as he built out the exterior walls and the uh, 
sidewalls of the canal, the ram uh, puddling as well, to keep it waterproof. Uh, so this is a very fine example of construction all round. And uh, the interesting thing is it's the only canal structure, really, that features in Breeze Railway practice. So it's recognised uh, by the early railway engineers as a model construction and design. Steam was used occasionally for found pumping out foundations and bridges. Smeet designed one about 1760 and Brindley supposed to have used one around about the same time, but they really came into their fore in those uh, dock works I described. Movable bridges, well, a transition from, if you like, medieval style draw bridges using timber, the introduction of iron, particularly for the, so they went from draw bridges, lift bridges to swing bridges, and ultimately around 1800 cast iron swing bridges. And some of these structures can still be seen on the waterways. And skew arches seem to me to be quite an important uh, innovation, really. There's not much evidence of any uh, before the Canal Age. They're generally seen to be introduced by William Chapman when he was working in Ireland. So quite where he got the idea from, I'm not sure, but the uh, dark of illustration shows, illustrates his article on skew arches in the uh, Recyclopedia, and you can see in the middle, if you like, his layout drawings. Uh, and on the, the lighter drawings from Telford's article on inland navigation, but the article's actually written by David Henry, who was the RE on the uh, Glasgow Paisley and Ardossian Canal. So these are sort of works going on in the 1790s through to 1820. In the 1820s, the idea caught on. Chad Gold tried to describe it, and Peter Nicholson famously in 1828, which is normally when uh, textbooks appear on the subject in England. So this is uh, on the Rochdale Canal, Jessup Engineer, Crosley again, uh, the resident an engineer, this is Marsh Barn Bridge, and you can see nicely cut stonework here, uh, presumed to be on Chapman's system. Then we've got a slightly earlier uh, skew bridge by Sheesby, whose contact we saw on the Coventry Canal, which I'd describe as a botched brick design. But there we are. The interesting thing is by the 1820s, they're fairly standard on the Macclesfield Canal, William Crosley with Telford, uh, Knowles, the contractors who worked on canals. Uh, several of these survive, uh, but the most famous examples, of course, of these early skew bridges now are the ones on the Liverpool-Manchester Railway, of which there are a lot. Uh, and this is more or less the same time as the Macclesfield Canal. So it's become general. It's developed on the uh, canal network, but it's general generalized here. And a bit about iron bridges. Uh, well, John Rennie certainly introduced them on uh, Kennington Avon at Sydney Gardens. Some of these are quite attractive. Different designs obviously being marketed to an extent by the uh, ironworks companies. But the most famous examples really are the aqueducts. Ponty Caffney in uh, Merthyr uh, is one of the earliest iron bridges at all. And then they start to be used on canals uh, in the mid 1790s. Uh, and I suppose this one here, Longdon on Turn, replaced a masonry, uh, uh, masonry aqueduct that had failed. Uh, and I imagine this was a fast solution supplied by the uh, iron master, William Reynolds. But Telford said, having observed the masonry of aqueducts where puddle was employed to be cracked, very subject to leakage, some not infrequently obliged to be taken down and rebuilt or tied across by strong iron bars, these circumstances led him to consider of introducing of cast iron work. Uh, so there we are, that's what he claimed. Uh, and of course, there were these classic examples that he did. Uh, Initially at Shirk with a an iron cast iron deck and masonry sidewalls, uh, and then Ponkasulti, uh, and the, the innovation of Ponkasulti is well, I say innovation is not just uh, using uh, 
gas iron at the top there, but he's using uh, hollow piers at the top as well. And he's recognizing the need uh, in these aqueducts to have hollow piers all, really all the way down. If they were, could be built strongly enough. So there's a lot of innovation going on here that carries on into the railway age uh, on these aqueducts. It's not just the cast iron. So before the canal age, there was some expertise in this country in navigation works and bridge building, muck shifting and in reservoir design. In the 1760s, Bindley, Smeaton and others had established good practice. From 1790 to 1820, the groundwork was established for the railway age and sort of innovations were seen, the structured use of cast iron, hydraulic mortars, skew arches. And in the 1820s, contractors are carrying out works on a scale anticipating railways. And uh, I'm quite happy to take questions. There are some things deliberately admitted because of time, not because of knowledge. And there are other things I've glossed over because I don't have the knowledge. So if you want to know about paddles on canals, you can ask somebody else. Anyway, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for that. As you said, uh, some discussion. Is anyone, have one already from the Zoom? Right, um, David Henthorne Brown from Birmingham uh, is asking, how was, this, how was the surveying and setting out done? The theodolites were not yet, were not yet available. I've suggested that plain tables were used, but without evidence. Do you know the answer, Peter? <laughs> I, I, I'm surprised at the statement that uh, yeah, the other yeah. lights were not yeah. available. There was something very similar. Yeah. But certainly plain tables that were available. Sure. The, well, what I would say is in the early minutes of the canal company, so the, the strap, uh, the Coventry Canal, and the uh, Oxford Canal, they were ordering what I assume with levels and theodolites. So I, 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 I think that they were available. And the instrument that I showed on the uh, Thames and Medway, that was capable of getting a, driving a canal, uh, canal tunnel dead straight. So I think that uh, they did have access to good surveying instruments at the time. Anyone? Um, yeah. Welcome. You're the purveyor of the microphone. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Um, I have to turn it on. Please hold it to your. Oh. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, James Campbell uh, asking a question. Uh, so, uh, Mike, um, the, the clay was puddled to make the canal waterproof. Were there examples where this gone, went wrong? The canal, they just filled the canal with water and the water just disappeared. Yes. And uh, <laughs> also, I think when you went through the wrong rock strata as well. Uh, yes. They, they filled, uh, they filled. Yeah. And they, they took made assumptions about the kind of ground they were going through and so that they'd be anticipating to have better soil conditions than they had. But I, I think the main problem they had really was not so much the puddle thing, which if you knew about that, you could deal with it. You know, the, the recipe was known, but it was with when you had something like quicksand in a tunnel or the, the, the mall uh, formations, but the Birmingham Liverpool Junction Canal went through, where there was ter terrain that went through strata prone to slippage. And they went, that, that was the real, I think the real problem that, there were problems with leakage, but I, I think really it was. They, they knew what how to use puddle if you, right. if, you if, if you follow me. It's the uh, ground properties of some of the ground they were going through. They were less. And, and the second about. question, the second question is, um, I mean, obviously by the 18th century, hydraulics in France is quite um, is quite developed, but none of that's relevant to this, is it? I mean, they they they, they merely trying to calculate the number of wheelbarrows it's going to take to shift the earth. And then they fill it with water, but the water's not actually moving in the canal. It's like a giant reservoir. So Bellador is completely irrelevant. Well, to an extent, but I, I mean, if you think of that uh, 
burning of canal navigation as an example. There's an enormous hydraulic tunnel taking the water to supply the canal from the Rotten Park Reservoir down to the canal. So I think they, they were aware of the gradients and the safe gradient as well, and they probably made mistakes with the safe gradient. So I, I think that, that if you look at Smeaton's library in particular, he had a lot of flow of bridge books available to him. Uh, but could time. he understand them? I mean, could he? Oh, ever... I'm sure he did. He was cleverer than us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, no, seriously. I, I, I mean, uh, as, as a completely aside, really. I, I, I over the weekend, I reread Telford's uh, article on in the navigation, and I, I completely overlooked the section where he talks about retaining wall design, and he talks about the continental theories and. So they're relevant or otherwise, and he slags off Bellidor as being ridiculous in his approach to the design of the lock walls because he said they were liable to topple over. So I, I think they, it's a bit like Baker at the end of the 19th century. It wasn't that they didn't know about the theory, but they didn't, they didn't think it matched up with reality. Yeah, it's Michael Tutton. I'm just wondering, where does um, Hugh Middleton and the New River fit into all this? We, we, uh, which, of course, is a, a water supply canal which runs from Ware in Hertfordshire to um, New River Head uh, and built in the uh, third quarter of the 17th century or thereabouts? First quarter. First quarter. And how did that influence... Um, the canal builders, if at all. Uh, well, I mean, uh, Robert Milne, who wasn't on the table because he didn't really feature enough, uh, was involved with a number of canals, and he was the engineer to the New River Company, so he would have been aware of the works in a practical sense. They had a steam pumping engine, uh, they had reservoirs. Uh, so in that sense, the canal engineers would have been aware Smeaton had, was involved with it. Uh, but, you know, we're talking about five generations, six generations on, really. So I think it would be a thing you go and look at, really. But going back to the point about understanding flow, uh, there's a, an article by Norman Smith about how the surveying might have been carried out for that at the beginning uh, of the... Uh, 17th century uh, and with a view to the flow rates, having a safe flow rate. So, uh, you know, pe people could work this out reasonably successfully if they were bright enough. Of it. Well, I think that sometimes they talk about a model and it's a drawing. If you do, do you follow me? It said that on that spec for the uh, brick bridge, it says model or plan. So there's a bit of ambiguity there. I, I, I don't think that the well, Smeaton provided drawings for the, his bridges, uh, and Rennie did, but I'm not sure whether Brindley did at all. Uh, but the the Masons themselves would have had some idea how to build these things. They weren't built in isolation, I don't think. Uh, so I, I, I think that they, uh, if you didn't know how to do it, then there'd be a sketch with dimensions, and that was it, probably. I don't know. Mm. Uh, the Hartleys in the West Riding of Yorkshire, uh, as uh, the currently bridge masters, they did provide very detailed drawings, but that's probably from about 1810 onwards. Not before then. The, the, the other thing, perhaps, that you'd add to it is that the uh, Brindley insisted 
on the supervising, the overseeing masons and bricklayers and carpenters that he employed, went to go and see the work that he'd been doing elsewhere. So when he started a new canal job, the new but newly appointed people went, went off to see how it was done or had been done. So that's a, another form of model, if you like. Got another one from Zoom. Um, yeah, Andrew Smith's like to ask a question. So, uh, Andrew, if you could unmute yourself and then um, ask the question, please. Yeah. <clears throat> I have done. Um, on on the New River, the manuals of surveying available when they started. Sorry, you okay, Peter? Yep. Sorry, the manuals of surveying available when they started building the New River merely said that the terminus of a channel should not be higher than its beginning. Um, by the time that <clears throat> the new river had been completed, they were saying that a channel <laughs> must have a fall of four and a half inches in a mile. And all of the surveying manuals say that. I believe that gradient was established empirically I don't think they had any theoretical basis for it. Um, <clears throat> Norman Smith's article on the surveying instruments is a discussion of whether or not um, Edward Wright, who started off as Middleton surveyor, but um, did something naughty and was sacked, um, whether Edward Wright used optical glasses in his um, level. Uh, the, <clears throat> the evidence from the records of construction of the company is really uh, quite ambiguous. Um, it's just <laughs> the only evidence we have is that, uh, that Edward Wright's successor, Edward Pond, who's a very egregious character, um, his level required two men to carry it. And my guess is that that is because it was a really long water level. And that's how they established the, the gradient that they got. But I think there was a fair amount of suck it and see. Um, so by the time you get to the 18th century, things have moved on very substantially. Finley seems quite pleased with his instrument. Well, I, I think it's not quite true that the uh, canal stopped when the railway started, but Telford had a, a major scheme on the go. The Birmingham Canal Company remained quite prosperous for a long time, still building cuts and improvements. The Ten Valley Canals, uh, well, into the, well, well into the early railway age, Manchester Ship Canal, uh, so it, it, I think that possibly what's true is that the canals that were going to be commercially viable have been built largely by the 1830s and the sort of motorway thing that Telford was trying to do, the Birmingham-Liverpool Junction Canal, to try and speed things up. Uh, I mean, much, much more difficult to have done through the... Uh, Pennines, I think. So possibly, you know, the, the network was there in a sense. The, the ones, the canals that made money, I think a lot of them continued to make money in partnership with railways. Is it 
just going to say that there was a, another scheme which did not go ahead, which was the London and Birmingham Junction Canal. It was a bypass for the uh, Grand Junction Canal. And that would, of course, have linked up in Birmingham with the Birmingham Liverpool Junction Canal. Was the Grand Western Canal, which sort of falls at about the time the railways came into existence? Well, the, the Grand Western, of course, uh, did eventually um, connect up to Thornton, and but the southern half was never built. But uh, that was basically because they had steamships by that time, which could uh, confidently go around Land's End. And there was no need to get an inland waterway from Bristol to the south coast. Another one from Zoom. Um, uh, David replied to, um, that Brindley's level is preserved in a museum in Leek in Staff Staffordshire. You get that, too. Yes. No. Yeah. Well, I'll just yeah, yeah. We're just saying that Bradley's level survives. I didn't quite catch the museum. It's, it's in in Leek in Staffordshire. In Leek. No more than. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for that. I may ask uh, you to uh, propose a vote of thanks. Hi, Mike. Uh, that was an amazing romp through the history of canals and comprehensive, time wise, geographically, right across the country, because many of us know a bit about some canals, but you've been everywhere. And uh, also, where that you laid out the development of contracting and design sort of when the railway started there was a sort of management and technical infrastructure that let that happen and I, I hadn't really seen that spread out before it was amazing work of scholarship I shudder to think how long they've been working about 40 years I think would that be a fair guess <laughs> not really 40 <laughs> well well done anyway thanks, thanks very much thank you very much